Trauma radiography, one of my favorites. So, definition of trauma, a sudden, unexpected, dramatic, forceful, or violent event. No fun for all. Uh, blunt, penetrating, explosive, thermal forces are common causes of traumatic in injuries. Trauma affects persons of all ages, can be anyone. Um, trauma is one of the leading causes of death. And x-ray techs in the ER, or actually anywhere really, they need to be prepared for a variety of procedures on patients in all age groups, so kind of prepared for anything. Um, leading cause of death uh, for ages 20 to 40 is trauma. They're going to present with a wide range of conditions, varying from fractures um, to life-threatening things that might be going on. Um, so x-ray techs need to have really professional judgment when they're obtaining their radiographs and I would say quick and efficient skills and be able to kind of multitask. Many standard projections that you would normally do on a patient who can walk, talk, and move, you're going to have to adapt to them and accommodate to their condition. So two main principles of trauma radiology would be that you have to take two projections taken 90 degrees or right angles from each other. So you need at least an AP and a lateral. How you obtain those is up to you or, or what the patient can do depending on um, tube angles or what you have to do but the entire structure or trauma area needs to be included so usually the joints above and below the area of trauma need to be included um, i would say take caution um, with removing any bandages or um, splints but do not remove the cervical collar okay don't take that off. If you have to, you get the trauma surgeon and they can take it off. Um, depending on the splint, you probably should not take it off. If you think you can x-ray through it, I, I tend to x-ray through it. Okay, so use caution. Some best practices. So speed. Um, efficiency in producing your quality images in the shortest possible time. Plan out your views. I love to sort of look at how the patient is positioned look at my orders and see how many, the least amount of moves I can make and get all of my APs done or all of my laterals done right in a row without moving my patient. So well, as soon as those orders come through, try and run through in your head your plan of action. I would like to start here. I want to move to this. Um, so your accuracy is key though. You, you don't want to move too fast where you give up your accuracy, accuracy or your quality. Right. So if you're moving too fast for yourself, you're going to end up taking a repeat. So, you know, don't go so fast. We're going to do that. So watch your OID and SID. SID tends to be um, an area where techs in the ER tend to get distracted. They're moving fast. You're further away than you think or you're closer than you think. So your technical factors are off. So I understand the patient's in pain. But that doesn't mean you rush and take a poor quality image. They still deserve the best images that you can take and being aware of Alara, right? Um, positioning. See what your patient can do. Don't force. See what they're able to do and then move from there. You may need to move your tube instead of the patient. Angling the cassette. Work with them. Um, practice standards. Expect to be exposed to bodily fluids in the ER. But, you know, don't go swimming in them. Put your gloves on. Put your gown on. Protect yourself. Immobilization. So you may um, definitely need to utilize sponges to help with immobilization. Be wary of tape, um, especially if it's an elderly patient with that thin um, skin. You don't want to rip anything off or make anything worse. Anticipation. Some injuries are going to require a follow-up. So... I know if it's a dislocation, they're coming back for me later on for a post-reduction. Um, and I try to plan for that. Attention to detail. Just be careful and pay attention to the patient. The patient's condition could change at any time. So make sure you are checking in with that patient, talking to the patient. Kind of some, their speech might have changed or their breathing rate might have changed or their color might have changed. Just start to be aware throughout your entire procedure, all right? Attention to ER protocols and scope of practice. So wherever 
you are, whatever facility you're working in, I'm sure they're going to have an ED image protocol. So in our trauma room for our clinical site, we do a portable chest and depending on the trauma, a portable pelvis. And we may do a one view of an extremity, but for the rest, they will come to us unless the patient is so severe, they have to go right to the OR. You may do more extremities in the room. Um, the patient then goes to CAT scan for whatever they need. Then they come over to our x-ray department and we finish off. Um, so, you know, definitely just don't go over your scope of practice. You're there to take the x-rays. You're not there to do really anything else, okay? Professionalism, you need to adhere to code of ethics. So talking about your trauma experiences, those need to be um, very, very vague. No details, no patient info absolutely no pictures on your phone, okay? Patient assessment is, there are seven major areas of patient assessment. Mental status, are they alert, drowsy, or unresponsive? Watch for their respiration, watch their breathing rate. If it starts to get difficult or labored, you wanna really pay attention to that. Skin color, um, are they getting super pale? The cyanosis, are they turning a little bit blue? That tends to be a term for boards, okay? Uh, is there a present? of open wounds are bleeding and if they start bleeding the bleeding needs to be controlled degree of sensation or presence of pain um, do they start to have lack of sensation that could be um, a red flag for spinal injury musculoskeletal integrity never force a joint um, to check for movement see what the patient can do uh, patient mobility, spinal injuries, you want to use modified methods. If they're in a neck collar, we're going to do cross table work or decubitus views. You're not going to be sitting that patient up and turning them on their side. Um, is your patient already in a position that's required? So you might always start your ankles as an AP ankle. Well, your trauma patient is fractured and they're in a lateral position. The foot is externally rotated. Don't rotate them up to do a lateral to do an AP, start lateral, start how they lie. I, that's how I work my way up. Least amount of moves, plan your views. Um, you know, does your patient have, can they stay on the stretcher for all of the things or do you need to move them to a table? I try and do, if I have to do stretcher work and then move to the table, I try and separate those out. Is there a language barrier? Can the patient understand you? Interpreters can be paged through the hospital system to help you um, assist that patient more efficiently. So the, in, in the trauma room, there's going to be a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of people around, especially our facility, because it's a teaching hospital. So um, the patient will be on a trauma stretcher. And you guys know the trauma stretchers by now. They're the red ones. We have the tray underneath. But there's going to be multiple doctors. There's going to be multiple nurses. There's going to be um, the nursing assistant or the circulators. There may be a trauma surgeon, depending on, you know, how bad it is. The paramedics might still be in the room. Um, there might be a social worker in the room, something like that. So it may be chaotic in the room, but if you can remember, you are usually there to do a portable chest 90% of the time. That's the one exam you're going to do. You could do, you guys do portable chest x-rays all the time. It's not any different. It's literally a supine chest, maybe a pelvis. But if you can focus on those two things, it's much less stressful. Um, so some procedures, general guidelines, patient prep, collimation, proper SID, ID markers, rad protection, patient instructions, and mobilization documentation. You guys know all this stuff. You do all this all the time. But patient prep, communication skills with appropriate touch and eye contact, trauma usually causes some anxiety. Your patient may not be cooperative with you, but that's not because they don't want to be cooperative, depending on if there's a head injury, um, anything like that. But you still need to communicate to them everything you're going to do. Check for potential artifacts. Explain why you're removing them and why. Secure all, the, all their personal effects um, using proper procedures. So make sure they are enclosed in something. Um, if you're taking off earrings or a necklace, I ask the nurses to track that, that we remove that and where we put it. Your image receptor collimated to field size. So 
Just because it's trauma does not mean you open your cones as wide as possible. Just because you have a 14 by 17 cassette does not mean you open your cones 17 inches for an ankle. I want you to stick to your guns, stick to what you know, and follow your quality protocols, all right? So if we don't normally do something in an 8x10, you still do it on an 8x10. So remember, when you increase your field size, you're increasing scatter. Increasing scatter decreases your image quality. Um, you're not going to be centered over joint spaces. If you're open, wide open on an ankle, your central part of your beam is not on that ankle joint. So it's then going to be at sort of an angle with the divergent beam. So don't lose those details for me. Call me as you normally would. SID. Um, normally you're going to follow 40 or 72 inch protocols for the views as we normally do. If you have to do a cross table spine, um, or cross table, like a decubitus abdomen, something like that in our ER, we can't get to 40 with the stretcher. So some of the rooms have a 59 or 60 option and you will need to use that. If you do something, say it's a lateral lumbar spine cross table in the ER and you are now at the 60 inch marker, you need to increase your technical factors. And just a reminder that cheater method, right? When you go from 40 to 72, you're going to multiply your mass by four. ID markers or BBs, you're going to still use your right and left markers on your images and make sure there are lateral borders whenever possible. Um, avoid using the digital annotation. A marker or a BB, those little skin markers might be used, um, especially for stabbings or shootings if they want to mark um, entrance and exit points. So they may put those on as well. Wrap protection, still shield your patients. Um, when you're in the trauma room, most of the staff will have lead aprons on, but you still need to ask. Everyone have lead? X-ray ready. The trauma room is loud. You do have to be loud. Those of you with the quiet voices, you know who you are. I want you to use your big girl and big boy voices, okay? Loud and proud, X-ray. Does everyone have lead or they need to move? Use your collimation and watch your technical factors, right? Just because you're moving fast, don't let your technical factors slide. Watch what the machine is has set up and change from there. Watch your red protection as well. Move your six feet back. Wear lead if you need to be closer. Wear lead for the trauma room. I know it's hot in there, but protect yourself. Foreign body. Um, so any alien object that enters the body, it could be by puncture or via a natural orifice. Many have to be surgically removed, um, but to localize using a radiograph, it's usually necessary to get two views um, So of where the object is. So you might have to do a lateral pelvis if someone has stuck something up their rectum. Why? We normally do just an AP pelvis, right? But they're usually looking um, anterior, posterior, or something like that. So they may ask you to do a lateral of something that you don't normally do a lateral. Say it's a lateral abdomen or a lateral pelvis. Um, that's for the foreign body. Uh, location, so right angle projections, 90 degrees from each other. We will do obliques. Um, and possibly tangential views looking for superficial foreign bodies. If it's um, superficial to the bone, it's in the front, you might be asked to do a tangential projection. Patient instructions, I still want you to explain, demonstrate positions when possible, explain breathing instructions for the patients who are cooperative or conscious at least, and keep your exposure time short. That'll help eliminate possibility of motion. Mobilization. Um, so depending on what they have on the patient, the trauma room or the trauma team that's with you, you can ask, is that removable or do I need to leave it on? Um, so just watch, look for any metal parts that could possibly show up. The femur braces for femur fractures, those have metal in them, but you cannot take them off once they're in there. So you leave them on, right? Sponges and tape are your friend. Tube angles are your friend. Work with what you got. Documentation. Because you're deviating or adjusting routine procedures, so you have to do a PA forearm instead of an AP forearm, you want to document that. I had to do a PA forearm. Patient was able, unable to cooperate. 
due to severe pain or fracture. Just write it down. All right. I'm going to pick up there. <clears throat> 